Oh, oh, oh. Alright guys, welcome back to Psych Substance. In today's video, I'm going to share with you guys a story of my very first time trying traditional ayahuasca, albeit it was in a very <laughs> untraditional way. I was invited to a very underground, very hush-hush, invite-only, secret ayahuasca temple with a brew that was made authentically in the rainforest by ayahuasca arrows. And the whole experience was unlike anything I've ever had before. Now, before I get into the meat of this story, uh, let's do a little bit of a backstory on why I was invited. In fact, this was a birthday gift orchestrated for me by Jasmine, and we were attending the day before my birthday. It's not my idea of what I would want to do for my birthday. I mean, I appreciate the thought, Jasmine, thank you. God damn, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't fun by any means. This is not at all what I would consider a good time. So let's just preface it by that. This was a challenge and I'm gonna get into that shortly. So apparently Jasmine had been trying for a while to uh, get invited to one of these things and this was her second time attending and she was all for it. Her first time, it was amazing, she said. She had a really eye-opening experience and she just loved the whole community aspect. So, I let her pack our bags for this excursion. We had like two giant bags of stuff, of blankets, of these fold-out beds. Um, I guess she knew what she was going in for because we were going to be stuck there for nine mother hours. That was my biggest gripe. I was like, what on earth am I gonna do for nine hours? When I got there, I understood, but upon arriving, I was really up at arms about this whole nine hour thing. Because in my experience, when I trip, even if it's acid, for me, I'm done in six. Things come on really strong, hard, and fast for me, and then they wear off just as quickly. So we got there, I was a little disgruntled, to say the least, about the whole thing. And immediately, the first thing I noticed was there's the guy at the door, and he gave me a big, warm hug. I'm holding these big-ass bags, we trudged our way up the stairs, and immediately I noticed how bloody packed it was. They definitely crammed as many human bodies into that small space as they could. It was just wall-to-wall -wall with people. In fact, they kind of set it up like a church. There was, at the front, the hosts, who had a bunch of recording equipment, and they were had all their instruments, apparently it's like a concert and they're up there getting ready to play their music and uh, there's a little walkway in the middle and they had set up all the bedding on either side of, and uh, you're just all facing the front. So it was not only filled with people, but it was very dark. They had like tea candles and candles everywhere were lighting the whole area up. But yeah, it was a really interesting group of people too. It wasn't just a bunch of young hipsters. I saw full families of people, all age groups. There was a lot of couples, actually not very many young people, if any, really. Um, so anyway, we, we got comfortable, we sat down, we just kind of waited for things to begin. And it, we had a very long intro. Before we actually drank, they took us through the, all these relaxation techniques, they did some EFT, some tapping, and I really respect that they went out of their way to uh, get everybody in a nice, calm, meditative state. But just for me, I have my own rituals. I like to do my own meditation before I take a psychedelic. But you know, when in Rome, I kind of had to just go along, did the tapping, did the breathing, um, I, I tried to be as into it as possible, and then it was time for the ayahuasca. Now, I would say 90% of the people there were drinking ayahuasca, but maybe five to 10% were having magic mushrooms instead. So it was it was an interesting mix of compounds too. I'd never seen anything like it. Traditionally, ayahuasca is a mix of bee cappy vine and Chacruna leaves, which are containing of the light. The light being DMT, the bee cappy contains the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which makes the DMT orally active. One of the hosts was familiar with me and some of the work I do, and they were familiar that I have a lot of experience exploring, and they said they wanted to start me off at a big dose. And I was a little apprehensive because yes, while I have a lot of experience exploring, I'm the first person to recognize that when you're trying a new compound, you want to test the waters first and start gentle. But she assured me, she's like, look, you're probably not even gonna really trip. Um, it, it's not like you think, it's not gonna be like a full-blown DMT experience, it's gonna be very light. And I think she was thinking that if she didn't start me off at like the highest end of their starting dose that they offer, uh, I wouldn't feel it. Now, a normal starting dose is 30 to 50 milliliters of ayahuasca, which doesn't really mean much because 
it, depending on how it's produced and how much they condense it down, that could mean a variety of different potencies. So she started me off at 70 milliliters. So that's double, more than double what some people start off at. And I was like, all right, fine. You know what? I can take it. But now mind you, I had a theory. But anyway, before we continue with this intriguing story, there is a message coming up from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by none other than Surfshark. Surfshark protects your privacy from being penetrated via the internet. Everything we do now is tracked, monitored, watched. Our internet provider can see everything. So what happens when you use a VPN is it actually blocks your internet provider from being able to spy on everything you're doing. So if you're watching taboo videos like this or researching what substances you don't wanna take, you absolutely need to be under the protection of a VPN. And if you sign up right now with the code psyched to Surfshark, you're going to get a whopping 83% off, which unlocks the best price for a VPN presently on the market, as far as I know. You're also getting an extra three months free. They're giving you a spectacular deal. And all you gotta do is head on over to the link in the description and use the code psyched to unlock all of that. Another extra bonus that I always talk about that you can unlock is if you're watching, say, Hulu or Netflix, you can change your location, which will unlock a whole slew of new videos. So that's an added bonus that you're gonna all get if you're using a VPN. Last bonus you get is you help me, because the more of you guys that sign up to Surfshark, the more likely they are to keep sponsoring these videos. Anyway, let's jump right back into the video. So she started me off at 70 milliliters. So that's double, more than double what some people start off at. And I was like, all right, fine. You know what? I can take it. But now mind you, I had a theory that it takes time for the monomies to be inhibited in your body. And I've always wondered why in the rainforest they suggest that you drink the both brews in one versus if you're doing the say pharmaosca route, you would actually take the MAOI first wait 30 to 40 minutes, and then take the DMT once your MAOIs are inhibited. How does it work in the rainforest where you take it all at once? Because while the MAOIs are being inhibited, the DMT that's in the brew would technically get broken down. And my theory was this is why they offer at least two cups. Because the first cup, for some people, does just blast them off right away. But for others, the first cup, it just inhibits the MAOs. So you need the second cup to actually introduce the DMT. And I was right. I took my 70, we sat, we had our eyes closed. The, uh, the people at the front began playing music, which was going to continue the entire time. That's right, they played music for like seven hours straight. They were thankfully very talented musicians because if they sucked and you had to sit through seven hours of it while you tripped, that would have been a gosh darn nightmare. But I'm very grateful that they were actually really good. It actually kind of felt like we were watching a concert. But anyway, I'll get into that in a bit. And this hat is getting hot. Anyways, we drank the 70. Um, as, uh, as we were first finishing our cup, they actually went around and they asked everyone to offer up one word, like their name and then a word, just to encompass what you were there for. And my word was courage, because I felt like it took a great deal of courage for me to step out of my comfort zone and finally do something ceremonially. By the time everyone was done saying their name and their word, you were supposed to be down your cup. So I had finished mine, I looked over to Jasmine and she was struggling to down hers. She said it tasted really gross. And for me, I was like, wow, Kratom tastes worse than this. And I used to drink that all, multiple times a day. Honestly, the taste was no problem. So we finished our cups, uh, I laid down and I waited. Now, as I was waiting and as the music started slow, started with slow songs, but I could tell there was a theme here, it was slowly, Picking up, I think their technique was to get the music to rise to like crescendo levels as your experience rises to um, peak levels. And I noticed the guy, probably everybody in the room noticed the guy that was beside me <laughs> because he began breathing hard. Like, <sighs> I was like, oh, he's gonna pop. And uh, sure enough, he was the first one throwing up, soon to follow him. I think a couple more people started puking. But I didn't feel nauseous at all. Well, I felt a little queasy, but I wasn't like over the top nauseous, not yet at least. And then an hour passes and both Jasmine and I are like, we're not feeling anything. There was definitely some people I could see around there that were like, they were starting to feel the effects. Uh, I, on the other hand, nothing. So uh, the one host that had known me, she came back over and uh, Jasmine requested that we have another cup. So she quickly poured us another cup and uh, we, we waited a little bit to drink it. I think it was about two hours after the first cup. And in my mind, I was starting to go like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to sit here for seven hours and not feel anything. At least if I feel something, the time will go by faster. So I downed that second cup really fast. And uh, 
it turns out my theory, oh boy, I was right, because I shit you not, not even five minutes after I drank it, the first inclinations of effect started to take hold, and it was very different than anything I was used to experiencing. The first thing I noticed was my lips. I know, weird, right? They started to tingle, and it spread throughout my face, down my body, and before I knew it, I was feeling very tingly and warm. Very warm and tingly all over, but not like a not like a pleasant like M warm where it's like radiating out of your stomach and you feel like you've got an internal heater that's just filling you with love and joy. I felt tingly and warm as if I just overdosed on drugs. Now keep in mind an overdose does not mean fatal overdose. They're two different things. All that overdose means is you took over the recommended dose for desired effects. Now I believe that I was having not too much DMT, but an overdose of the, of the Harmala alkaloids because it was not a pleasant feeling. My fingers kept doing this involuntarily. I had fucking claw hands. It sucked ass. I did not enjoy the claw hands. And I'm just sitting there just like sweating buckets, just thinking, okay, Adam, it's okay. It's just, it's a, overdose doesn't mean anything's wrong. Uh, I was running through all the bad interactions that can occur with ayahuasca in my head. Like, there's a lot of things you can't take with it. SSRIs could lead to serotonin syndrome, which is basically serotonin poisoning, which can kill you. Uh, if you take it with stimulants, say you're prescribed Adderall from your doctor, and then you took ayahuasca that night, that's a big no-no. You can die. So I'm just, like, going over my head. Are, did I have something that might have been high in even tryptophan before I got here? And I was like, no, no, I, I, I was pretty safe. Safe in the sense that I, there was nothing dangerous. But, you know, when you're in that state and the DMT's starting to kick in, you're, like, you're, you're getting a little nervous. And the twitching moved to just this really horrible full body discomfort emanating from my gut like it was very nauseating but it wasn't nauseating in the sense that you would expect people say that purging is a natural part of an ayahuasca experience it's your body's way of expelling not just uh actual toxins they say but it's more of an energetic release where you're releasing, say, negative emotions or things in your life that no longer serve you. If puking would have solved this nausea that quickly crept into intense discomfort, I would have been all for that shit, man. But I didn't feel like I was gonna puke, not even a little bit. The next thing that happens is people will shit. They say it comes out either one of two ways, either you puke or you shit. Guess what? No dice there. Didn't have to shit. My nausea was f***ing intent on just living inside my body and being trapped there. And you incorporate that with these involuntary claw hands, sweating buckets, tingling and vibrating all over. It felt f***ing shitty. And I was thinking, what was the host talking about? Before I drank the second glass, the host was like, Yeah, Adam, you're not going to trip, but you are going to feel the love. You're going to feel warm and love. And I'm like, if this is what she thinks love feels like, I've got news for her. There's better shit out there. Because this was awful. Awful. And I don't like saying that because I know there's a lot of people who benefit from ayahuasca. But all of these compounds affect every single human in such a uniquely different way. It's impossible to say whether you're going to love one drug. For example, some people have blissful times off mushrooms. Absolute time of their lives. It is nothing but pure euphoria. And then they take acid and it's all terror. And then there's other people who have just a gram of mushrooms... And they're terrified, but they can have like three tabs of acid and it feels like warm bliss. I'm the acid guy, by the way. I, I can handle mushrooms, but it's more like a grit my teeth and just try to bear through it than actually enjoy it kind of thing. So what I'm trying to say is we're all very different in which compounds affect us in um, subjectively good versus bad ways. I say subjective because sometimes, actually usually, it's those really challenging bad experiences that offer up the most learning and that can help you through the addiction and trauma the best. So I wasn't feeling good. I wasn't totally off put by this bad feeling, but it was the combination of that and then the DMT started to kick. Now I'm a big baby when it comes to body discomfort. I hate it. I know nobody likes it, but like, I'm just a baby. I can handle like my mind going inside out on itself. I can handle all of that stuff. Like I could be having a very weak mental trip 
but have like really intense negative body feelings and that'll just make me freak out. So that's just that's just how I am. And you would say, but Adam, you've, you've done DMT hundreds of times. And it's like, yeah, I've smoked it. And when I smoke it, I don't get the weird body feelings. My body feels actually blissful when I smoke it. I get warm vibrations of love when I smoke it. This was different. And again, I would attribute this to the Harmala alkaloids. I don't think my motto means like being inhibited. Now, as I'm just like, you know, I'm already trying to calm my brain down. Now I'm starting to trip. And uh, it's just, it's not comfortable. Because in the beginning stages, I actually couldn't figure out that I was nauseous. I couldn't put the pieces together that it was nausea I was feeling. I just knew that I felt really off. So I, I did my best. I, I tried breathing really deep. I was like, okay, none of this is working. And then I realized, oh, I gotta get this nausea out of me. So I got up and I started to move a little bit. I went to the back of the room. I did some stretches. Um, in fact, somebody came over and uh, they talked to me like, are you okay? I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just need to move. And mentally, I, I really was fine. It was just nausea. And then I was like, okay, let's try sitting down again. So I sat back down and goddamn the f music. As I sat back down, the nausea just like spiked to new levels and the DMT started to kick in harder. And as all of this was happening, the music was just going louder and louder and louder. Like one of the most important aspects of taking psychedelics, in my opinion, is being able to control the music. You don't wanna be stuck listening to intense music when it's too much for you because that makes the nausea worse. Anyone who's been in this situation knows what I'm talking about. When the music is really loud and overpowering and it's so fast and you're nauseous, even if you're not nauseous, sometimes when you trip, that whole configuration will bring you to puking. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta get the f away from here. So I got up, I went all the way to the back room and I like found this little nook in the corner. I went all the way back there and I just like took a breather. And I was like, oh my God. <sighs> and I started to feel better. The nausea started to wane. I was like, oh, thank goodness. Cause it was getting so intense. I couldn't handle it. Like again, if, if it was gonna come out and I was gonna puke, that'd be one thing, but it was just trapped. just freaking circulating through me and tearing me apart. Anyway, then I was like, you know what? Let's see just how high I am. And how I tell is by my reflection in the mirror. So I went over to the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, there you are. There's DMT Adam. I looked about how I would look if say I smoked, I don't know, a threshold dose of DMT, 15, 20 milligrams. Yeah, which is very interesting because it looks almost identical to me as I do on like two grams of mushrooms. I don't, I don't know what the damn difference is, to be honest. They're the same visuals for me. So I was like, all right, yeah, I'm adequately high. I went back in, I sat down. I, I just tried to breathe through it, but it was honestly just the nausea and my body discomfort and the twitching was so uncomfortable mixed with this weird, like real, I was feeling like really high, but without the visuals. There was maybe the faintest of closed eyed visuals, like if you really tried to find it. It's the most bizarre feeling to be, to like feel really high, to have your body feel really high. And like you're in a psychedelic trip, but you're seeing nothing. Like it was the weirdest feeling. I didn't like it. At least if I'm suffering, give me some, give me a light show to enjoy as I sit through this. Um, so I know I'm complaining a lot. Okay, I get it. I'm a big whiner, but this is my experience and I'm gonna tell it as it is. It gets worse. It, I, I, it actually gets worse. This woman behind us just starts howling. And not like a werewolf howling at the moon because she's happy of her transformation kind of howling. It was like fear and pain. And she starts screaming and crying like loud. This, this was actually my worst fear was I didn't want to take psychedelics in a big group of people because when, sometimes when one person starts to turn, it influences other people to think about negative things. And uh, a bunch of the helpers immediately went to her aid and tried to help her, but... It was not helping. It just, her her moans and her, like, her tears and her shouts, they just persisted. It actually persisted for maybe two hours. Like, <laughs> it was rough, man. It was rough. And I'm just thinking, Adam, just breathe. Just breathe. The whole time, I'm kind of, it was one of those grit your teeth and just wait till this discomfort goes away kind of feelings. There was no pleasure present anywhere. I just wanted it to end. And I'm like, the whole time I was just saying, you know when this ends, it's gonna feel so good. You're gonna be so grateful that you're normal. This is, some of these experiences, the best part is when it ends, cause it's like, you just put yourself through such discomfort. Now being normal feels like absolute bliss. And I was like, I was looking forward to that moment, but there was times when it was really tough, man, where I was like, oh, it was just too much. Yeah, it was honestly just too much discomfort for me. 
there, there is there actually are some good points to this experience, and let me get to them. But first, we gotta just sift through all this nasty negative shit till we get to the highlights, because there actually are some redeeming moments here. Anyway, so it was it was so tough to deal with this lady. I felt like I felt bad for this lady too, and I, I, I kept getting up to go to the bathroom to like just move around. And every time I would, I'd see at least a few people in the back with someone with them, and they were just pouring tears and crying. And like I, I'm not judging them for crying. I know that's that usually means you're having a very healing experience, and I'm great grateful that they had those experiences. But in my mind, where I was, I just kind of wanted to be around some happy people to maybe help pull me out of this darkness that I was feeling engulfed in. Anyway, so I went, I sat back down and it would come in waves. I would all of a sudden feel things lessen. And then I, and I made the mistake of getting excited. I was like, oh my God, it's ending. And then the wave, and then it like picked back up again and got intense again. I was like, ah, oh, back in this again. It honestly felt like it was just going to keep going forever. So I laid down and I started to breathe. This Asian lady, to me, while I was in my trip, she reminded me of that, you know, the lady with the antennae from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? I <laughs> shit you not, when she walked over, I was like, oh my God, it's that alien insect lady. She's here to rescue me. It was amazing. I was kind of smiling, like I was laying down, but I could see her down the walkway walking, doing this hand thing. And she looked at me and she smiled and walked over and started doing this weird hand motion over my body. And when she was doing this weird hand thing, I could actually feel the energy and the discomfort start to like swirl around and move around me. And uh, she finally like did this to like pull it up. And I could feel some of this like nausea. I know this sounds really woo woo, but I could feel it like woo, like a little whirlwind just and get sucked out. And I shit you not, after she did her little hand magic, I felt better. And then she put her hand on my chest, smiled, bowed her head and got up and left. I was like, thank God for alien hand lady. She saved me. <laughs> so after that, like that put a smile on my face. I was like, okay, okay, there's some warmth here. This isn't all just people screaming and good music. But um, yeah, it was like, it was honestly felt like a bizarre psychedelic church concert. I don't know how else to say it. It was like, let's take one of the most powerful psychedelics known to man and watch people play instruments. This is just, yeah, that's what it was, man. That's what it was. Anyway, so finally, I was like smiling now. I got up a little bit. I was like, oh, oh I could breathe. And finally, the experience started to end. And that's when the ayahuasca spoke to me. And now I, I don't actually think the ayahuasca spoke to me, but I think I was speaking to myself and I immediately was just flooded with tears. Like I started to actually tear up a little bit because I started getting this message coming through like, Adam, you are so hard on yourself. So hard, way too hard on yourself. And you've gone through a lot. Like I started remembering, um, you know, having like a child at 17 and all of this stuff that, I, that I've gone through and how I've constantly tried to see the silver lining and everything and pushed forward and been focused on growth. And I've gone through a lot of challenges, more so than I would have liked. And I don't ever look back and give myself credit for where I've come from. Instead, I tend to see what I'm not doing. You know, like I don't see all the good things I do. I see all the things I could be doing. I was like, dude, be grateful for who you are. You are very strong. You just made it through a really tough time and you just kind of white knuckled through it. You did great. And it was like I was able to um, congratulate myself and give myself some kind of praise for making it through a, what was actually, like, to be honest, it was a tough scenario. They gave me a big ass dose and then a second one. So like, yeah, God damn it, I was dosed high with ayahuasca and I was not comfortable and I made it through. And I was like, come on, just give yourself some credit. Give yourself a damn hug. You did, you're doing good. Stop beating yourself up for all the stuff that you can't, or that you're, you know, maybe you're just not where you want to be and that's okay. Show some compassion for who you are and where you are in your journey and you will get uh, where you want to be eventually. You know, the way I'm hard on myself, it doesn't help. It actually makes things worse. It slows down progress. So, you know, it was, it was a good eye-opening experience. And then I, I, you know, I was happier. I felt good. And um, I looked at my watch and I realized we were going to be there for another four hours. But I was so I was coming down, but because I made it through that hell, it wasn't so bad. I just kind of laid down, closed my eyes. I actually fell asleep. I know it's shocking. Their music was loud as hell, and we were right at the front, and I fell asleep. I woke up and I was fantasizing about going home and eating a gosh darn burger. 
I, my mouth was watering because I didn't, I had one light meal that morning because I knew we were going to be doing this. And I definitely pissed Jasmine off because all I talked about on the ride home was all the things I didn't like and she felt insulted and like I didn't appreciate her gift and I'm sorry. Um, there was, there was a lot of good things that came out of it and it was a cool experience. Anyway, that's my story. I hope you guys all enjoyed. If you did, make sure you smash that like button. Let me know below what types of videos you would like to see next. I know I've done so many acid videos and let's continue doing acid videos. No, I'm kidding. Let's, let's start doing some other, some other cool stuff like this. I haven't told a story in a long time. Anyway, I love you guys. Remember, all these videos have two versions now. There's a Patreon version, which is uncut. And then there's the YouTube version, which is heavily cut because we have to cater towards our capitalist gods over here. They're very strict with what they do and don't want. And as things are turning out, we really do need your support on Patreon. And I want to first of all say thank you to everybody who's pledged. A lot of you guys have pledged and it's been amazing to see. Um, but of course, we always need more pledges. That sounds horrible. But we've got some goals that we want to get to. And if even just like 0.1% of all my subscribers pledged two dollars that's it you go there you pledge two dollars and that helps us grow we would already be at our goal so yeah if you support what we're doing going on to, over to patreon pledge two dollars you can also go to our shop buy one of the blankets we're gonna have some new products soon don't want to overwhelm you with links until next time i'll see you guys all see you guys all later